the Audi Quattro, Lancia O37 and the Peugeot 205 T16, some of the most iconic names in rallying. Cars that pushed the limits of what was possible in a way that we haven't seen since. It was called Group B and is still held as the golden era of rallying. Group B was a class where manufacturers were allowed to go all out with almost unlimited power, crazy aerodynamics and new exotic materials. It brought about new technologies like four-wheel drive, semi-automatic gearboxes and clever turbocharging systems. However, it was only for the bravest of drivers. The hugely powerful cars needed a lot of manhandling to thread them through the tight twisty stages away from huge drops and dodging a sea of spectators. But how did this come about and what can we learn from the crazy cars that won in the Group B era? Rallying went wild in the 80s. The FIA wanted to attract more manufacturers and so created a class that would give the designers pretty much free reign. No power limits, no regulations on boost and whatever exotic materials you liked. Rally cars over the years have been largely based on road cars, with rules tightening and loosening on how close the relationship has to be between the stock car and the ones that actually race the stage. For example, in the Group A class, the manufacturers have to produce 5,000 road-going versions of the car before it is allowed to compete. In Group B, to lower the costs and interest of manufacturers, they ruled that only 200 cars needed to be produced. Group B also allowed almost endless modifications to be made, meaning the rally cars were nothing like the road cars at all. This approach really worked, attracting many manufacturers to Group B, names like Lancia, Porsche, Peugeot, Audi, Toyota, Ford, as well as so many more. Lancia took the Drivers' Championship in the first year of Group B with the O37. It was the last rear-wheel drive car to win in the WRC. It was incredibly light using fiberglass and Kevlar for the body and was powered by a mid-mounted 250 horsepower engine. It has much larger wings than many cars of the time with a huge rear spoiler to stabilize the car at high speeds. It was supercharged to avoid turbo lag and it was incredibly quick on the tarmac stages. However, it wasn't quite as quick on loose surfaces. So in stepped Audi with the Quattro, one of the most innovative rally cars of all time, a true game changer. It had an inline five engine with a very clever turbocharging system that produced over 450 brake horsepower. It had a small valve that kept the turbo spooled even when off throttle, meaning there was very little turbo lag, making the car quick out of the tight turns. The Audi also had a very aggressive aero kit with a huge spoiler at the front of the car and an even bigger wing on the back. This was one of the first sophisticated uses of aerodynamics in rallying. Drivers said it made the car extremely stable at high speed. The insane power was put through a clever semi-automatic gearbox and drove all four wheels. It was the first car to use a four-wheel drive system effectively. Before this, many manufacturers stuck to rear-wheel drive as they thought the additional weight would outweigh any time gains from the extra traction. And yes, the Audi was very heavy and the four-wheel drive system meant the weight was higher up than you would like in a rally car normally. But despite the compromised dynamics, it worked. The Audi had more power than the rest of the field, but could also use it more effectively, deploying more power even on surfaces like gravel, dirt and ice. Audi won its first race with the car and didn't really stop after that. They shaved seconds, if not minutes, off stage times. The Audi four-wheel drive system really changed the game in rallying. But the Audi dominance didn't last long. Peugeot came out with a car that would expose the weaknesses of the Quattro. They used a similar four-wheel drive system but packaged it very differently. Their secret was that they really nailed the car's dynamics. They built the car to look like the road-going 205, a small hatchback. It had a very short wheelbase, which generally makes cars more nimble at low speeds with the trade-off of less stability at high speeds. However, rally stages are often so tight and twisty that this strategy paid off for Peugeot. They also did everything they could to keep the weight central. They fitted a 1.8 litre engine in the middle of the car, although it didn't have the clever anti-lag system that the Audi did. So the drivers used an old trick to keep the turbo spooled up. They left foot braked for the corners while staying on the throttle. This kept the turbo spooled up and gave them immediate power on the exit. 
But what was really unusual about the 205 was the orientation they mounted the engine in. Normally, race cars have longitudinal mounted engines with the crank parallel with the direction of the car. However, Peugeot fitted it in a transverse orientation and instead of mounting the gearbox below the engine like in the Audi, Peugeot mounted it to the side. This meant that the majority of the weight in the car was between the two axles and could be mounted lower, making the car much more nimble and responsive in the corners. Low center of gravity means the car doesn't roll too much and if it's in the center of the chassis, the car is easier to rotate in the corners. The 205's weight distribution wasn't 50-50 though, it placed around 60% of the weight on the rear wheels. In simple terms, rearward weight distribution promotes oversteer and frontward weight distribution creates more understeer. This rearward bias meant the car was easier to turn in and control through the turns. You can really see this if you watch the Audi through the corners. The Audi was very front heavy and produced a lot of understeer. The drivers are trying to neutralize this with the throttle, but they have to correct the car several times through the corner. The Quattro understeers, then oversteers, then understeers again through a turn. The drivers really have to wrestle it through the corner. The Quattro was by no means an easy car to drive. Now look at the Peugeot. There is one smooth input on the steering and the car looks much more balanced and easy to drive. There is no wonder it was quicker. It's incredible to watch as these drivers control the car when at crazy speeds on tight and twisty rally stages. Also not forgetting they are threading the car through a sea of spectators on the stage. But why are the fans allowed to be so close to the cars? The stages are public roads, meaning anyone could go and spectate. However, it meant that many got extremely close to the cars. Back then, people did get hit, but it was considered to be part of the challenge for the drivers. They often kept it pinned and had to hope that the fans would get out of the way in time. This guy even had to jump over a passing car. Many manufacturers understood that Peugeot's approach was the way to go, all producing smaller, short wheelbase cars with all the weight in the middle. MG created the Metro with a distinctive boxy shape and a huge front wing, and the Renault 5 took a similar approach too. However, it was Lancia that did it the best. They finally scrapped rear wheel drive after being uncompetitive all year. So they created the Lancia Delta S4, a short wheelbase four wheel drive monster. Firstly, they developed an engine with a genius twin charging system. They fitted a supercharger to avoid the lag of a turbo, a bit like the Lancia 037. However, this created less power at high revs. As a supercharger is directly driven by the engine, it can provide boost at low revs, but saps more and more power as the revs climb. So what Lancia did was fit an additional turbocharger that would provide boost at high revs. So low end boost was provided by the supercharger before cutting out and letting the turbo take over at higher revs. This meant the Delta S4 was amazingly powerful and had the grip to put it down onto the stage. It took many wins before eventually bringing the Group B era to a close. This era of rallying was amazing to watch. Incredibly fast cars and amazing drivers all pushing to the limits of what's possible. There were different winners every year and cars that looked remarkably different with incredible engineering. However, you can't ignore the fact that it was extremely dangerous. The cars were too powerful, difficult to drive and not enough emphasis was put on the safety of drivers and spectators. The biggest issue was the minimum weight rule. Cars could weigh as little as 890 kilograms. So to be competitive, manufacturers would do anything they could to get this limit down. This created a breed of cars that were very fragile and not up to the job of protecting drivers in a crash. Many of the drivers explained that if this weight limit was higher, more strengthening could have been added to better protect the drivers in a crash. Several huge crashes happened. In Portugal, Santos crested a rise in his Ford RS200. He lost control and went off the course, horrifically injuring 31 spectators and killing three. All the teams immediately pulled out of the rally and it left Group B hanging on by a thread. A few months later, the final blow came. Lancia's Henry Toivonen was the championship favorite when he lost control late in a fast turn. He was winning by a huge margin when he and his co-driver Sergio Cresto came flying off the road, heading down a steep hill. 
The impact ruptured the fuel tank, spilling fuel over the red hot turbocharger, sending the car up in flames. After the incident, it was barely recognizable as a car and both Henry and Sergio were killed in the crash. This led to many manufacturers pulling out and the FIA ended the Group B class the following year. You should watch this video where I explain what it takes to modify a rally car to set the outright record at Pikes Peak or this other video that I think you'll love. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.